I'm Stephen John Drew from Better Podcasting, a podcast about podcasting, part of the Gunna Geek Network. Just like the show you're checking out now. Shows on the network are individually owned, and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find fantastic geeky shows at GunnaGeekNetwork.com. Welcome to Play Comics, where once again we are here talking to a creator about their cool stuff. This time we have Dennis Hopeless here to talk about his upcoming vault comic, Hard Eyes. Dennis, how are you today? Doing well. Thanks for having me on. I'm so excited to get to look at another vault book. It's it's just something that brings these great writers to them. But we can't start off there. First, I have to know, what is your elevator pitch for Hard Eyes? Hard Eyes is the hardest book to elevator pitch. I was just telling you this off air because it starts out as one thing and it shifts into another thing. Um, So I've I've been trying to craft a good one while I've been doing press for it. Um, And what I've come up with is it is like Romeo and Juliet in a Lovecraftian monster apocalypse. These two kids meet each other um, after the fall of the world when monsters have eaten everything and all of humanity is hiding and they, they start to fall in love, but humans don't trust each other anymore. Like everybody that survived is living in these little pockets and everything equals death. So this kid you know, sees this girl and thinks, oh, this is the girl of my dreams, but his family just sees like a manic pixie nightmare come to kill them all. So it's, uh, yeah, it's like a big, crazy, Lovecraftian horror romance comic. Well, if I may, well, let me throw another one at you. Um, Hard Eyes is a book written by Dennis Hopeless with art by Victor Ibanez and Addison Duke and lettered by Simon Boland and Vault is pitching it. And if you need anything more than that, then don't just go buy it. Yeah, the real, the real selling point is the art team, if we're being honest. Like, I, I'm really proud of the work that I'm doing in the book, but Victor and Addison together are just this killer combo. The, the book is gorgeous. I've been doing these um, trailers, I guess, where I take the art and put music to it and make little videos. Just because it's so pretty, I want to show the art off in different ways and get people to see it. Um, but yeah, they're, they're knocking my socks off with every issue. How much art direction did you give them on this one versus just telling them, here's a vague idea, have fun? I write pretty detailed scripts uh, simply because I want to make sure what I'm asking for is possible, um, at least at first. Uh, once you have a good rapport with an artist, it's a lot easier to kind of you know, give them more rope to do whatever. And Victor and I worked together on Jean Grey back at Marvel, um, which was a teenage Jean Grey series that ran for about a year and so I've worked with him before and love his art and totally trust him Uh, but Victor likes a lot of detail um, because he's very uh, what's the word he's meticulous in his in his art so like I there's a scene in the book that takes place in a bookstore and most artists would draw one establishing shot of the bookstore and then never draw books again because, you know, it's a talking heads page. Victor drew the most beautiful bookstore anyone's ever seen on paper in every single panel. There are a billion books in this like three page scene because it's just how it works. So Victor likes those details. If I don't give him those details, he'll DM me and ask me for more details about it. So it's, it's pretty full script, pretty detailed, but I always make clear, even with new collaborators, I trust the artist more than myself. Anything you want to change, go ahead and change. We'll, we'll figure it out in the dialogue and in the lettering draft and do whatever. So Victor and I are in constant communication. If he doesn't understand something, doesn't like something, wants to change something, uh, like I'm totally on board for that. So where did the idea for this story come from for you? Uh, so Victor and I, like I said, we worked together at Marvel um, a few years ago, and we had always wanted to do creator-owned stuff together. And then uh, 
when the COVID lockdown was first kicking off, we all got pencils down and like all of our books got paused or canceled or paused and then canceled. Uh, and I was going insane. Um, I was like, well, we just moved into a house and I just gutted it and completely remodeled it. But now that it's like nothing to do in the house. So it's finding projects, and digging up rocks in the backyard, and painting the garage and all the stuff that didn't need to happen because I felt kind of worthless. And, you know, everybody was a ball of anxiety in the early COVID days. And Victor posted this image on his um, Facebook profile of Lupe, our main character, and then like a crazy squid monster thing. And I reached out and I'm like, what is that? What are you doing with that? That's awesome. And his answer was, I mean, this is Lupe. <laughs> you want to do a comic about her? So it kind of came from this amazing drawing Victor had done. He basically just wanted to do like this girl and her monster friend book. And my early COVID anxiety and like worry about the state of the world and how everybody was like sort of keyed in to everyone else online, but also super lonely at the same time. I think that's what led us down the monster apocalypse Lovecraftian road. Monster apocalypse is a good way to be here, though. Yeah, it, you know, it's interesting. We get, I think there's a lot of post-apocalyptic stuff cropping up right now because people are in that headspace. So it's interesting to see how different creative teams and, you know, different filmmakers and stuff are dealing with the same stuff now that the, all that fiction's coming out. Um, and our book, The Monster Apocalypse, is definitely, it's looming in the background, it's the setting, but it's not the point. Like, it takes place at years after all this has happened. And these two characters, like, kind of never thought they would get to have the traditional kind of, you know, young love that that that, that they're seeing. Like, Vic, uh, Rico, the the um, male lead, has hasn't seen anyone his age since everyone died. Like, he's been living with his family and surviving in San Antonio, but there's there's like not girls his age around. So when he comes across one on the street by herself, in the, you know it's impossible she's this crazy unicorn that shouldn't exist and shouldn't be alive <clears throat> so it, yeah it, i don't know it plays with the desolation but it's not about the end of the world it's about relationships and longing and loneliness and loneliness and mental illness and all the other stuff that would come with uh the fall of man why san antonio because the river walk seems like a really funny thing after like after earth like an overgrown city uh where all the humans are dead and you know the dead and rotting and no one lives there anymore but it's been destroyed by this monster apocalypse something like a tourist river walk designed to get people to walk around and buy things it was a really amusing thing to see to me and i had um been to san antonio not that long ago and like experienced the river walk so we thought it was a fun um just a fun setting to play with I think you made a really good choice there with it. Yeah, Victor was, um, <laughs> I think Victor was a little annoyed because he had to do all this research about what, like, the river walk and how deep the river was and if this, if it made sense for them to be able to be under the water. Because I think in reality, the, the, it's only like three feet deep. And so I'm like, it doesn't matter. No one gets in the river there, like, in real life. No one's going to question it. But, um, yeah, it's, I stressed him out with the river walk. Which, I guess I should explain that. In San Antonio, downtown, there is a river that you can ride little river boats on that go around uh, like a little uh, dining and shopping area that has bars and restaurants. And so if you're a tourist in San Antonio, you go like walk, walk around the river and buy things. And that's the, the opening of the book takes place there. So one other thing you also mentioned was mental illness here. And that is something that I'm also seeing popping up in a lot of these... Um, COVID comics and how is that something that you've been able to deal with while writing this? I mean, it was kind of the starting point. Um, I, we, you know, we wanted to figure out a way to make a monster apocalypse a little bit more human and a little bit more um, deep than just, you know, these things kill everything. And so we started thinking about it in terms of um, like what it would do to you anxiety wise and what it would do to you like any any we all 
are a little bit crazy. We all have a little bit of mental illness that we deal with. We have childhood trauma. We have this, we have that. We have stress, we have stressors. And I think what we learned during COVID is that when cr big, crazy, scary things happen to the world, all that is intensified and it becomes harder to do your job, harder to get out of bed, harder to have these interpersonal relationships and make them work. And also much easier to be angry and to um, like look for monsters in the real world that you can uh, you can try to slay. And so in the book, there's literal monsters out there that have destroyed everything and people are trapped inside, trapped together and have grown for years in this environment that, you know, like plays on your mental illness. And so both characters um, are carrying around a lot of baggage from that. Uh, Rico, his, he's the youngest member of his family that survived, and some of the older members of the family died trying to keep him safe because he was young. And now he's sort of come of age, being the one everyone's trying to keep alive and like having to carry the weight of that. Like, it's, is it his fault his mom's dead? Is it his fault his grandma's dead? Is it his fault that everybody has to try so hard? And so when he introduces something challenging, like here's a new person that I want you to trust because I want to have this relationship, that's a lot for them and that's a lot for him. And then Lupe has been alone on the road in a place where like that's not supposed to be possible. So she is like looking for community, looking for um, human interaction. And so she's got this intense loneliness that she carries around with her and everyone's afraid of her because you would be like people aren't supposed to just be alive on the street so if someone wanders up you don't trust them it's like a meeting a new character in the walking dead or whatever right um and so yeah they they, they both have sort of similar but competing um mental illness <laughs> that make make their relationship even more challenging i think that might be the plot line that is going to interest me the most in how those two issues interact with each other, especially bringing the rest of Rico's family into it because they don't want to trust anybody. But how do you get more people if you don't trust anybody? Yeah, that's it's a point that Lupe makes early in the book is that like everybody's sad that all the people went away, but when we encounter new people, we just want to shoot them in the head so that they can't hurt us, um, which is kind of how it felt if you're like being trapped at home with you you only had your small little circle of people you interacted with at the beginning of covid and it felt like the rest of the world was just this intense fireball that was out to get you um and it did it made it it made it hard to connect even with people we had been close with before and so yeah we just amped that up um and there's this book <laughs> It, it goes in such crazy directions so quickly that the first issue um, is all about setting up the world and making you fall in love with these characters so we can just, just utterly destroy them in every way, starting with issue two. Um, so yeah, it's that that element of the book is, is a massive through line that's going to pull us through a lot of crazy. Well, heck, even just the reveal in the last couple pages for me was what the heck. Yeah. Uh, Lupe is a complicated lady, we'll say. How much of the story do you have written already, at least in your head? Uh, so it's a five-issue miniseries, at least to start. Um, Victor is almost done drawing issue three. Issue four, I am polishing up. Um, tomorrow, it should be done with that. And then uh, issue five has been plotted. And, and ready to go for a while. Uh, I tend to figure out the endings in as much detail as the early part of the story and then kind of let the middle find itself. Um, so we, we know where we're going. Uh, that's the, the, one of the great things about Vault is it's a small publisher, but like the editor-in-chief is like really involved. Adrian is really involved in story on every, like all of this. You know, I, I pitched the book, but then we kind of found the story through conversations we had after I turned in the first issue and the plot outline and all of that. So it was very well figured out before we really got started. Did you bring this to Vault or did they come to you? No, yeah, I brought it to Vault. Um, like I said, there was a period of time where all of work stopped in comics because Diamond stopped shipping. And I had... Uh, 
collaborators that I wanted to work with that I, you know, that had worked with Marvel or that I knew from cons or whatever, but I had never had time in my schedule to um, to start new stuff, and suddenly I had all this free time. So I developed two different creator-owned work books during that time with um, friends and, and former collaborators, one of them being Hard Eyes. And I was trying to figure out the the best publisher to take it to, uh, and I just happened to see, I, I think I saw a press for Barbaric, and that book looked awesome. And then um, Alex Pacadell was talking about his vault book he was doing, and I, I'm friends with Alex, so I reached out to him and asked him. And he sang Vault's praises so loudly that like immediately it was the only place I wanted to take it. Uh, someone said online the other day that they're like the A24 of comics, and that is exactly what it feels like. They, they do these weird, thought-provoking, um, sort of disturbing comics that are beautiful. And that's, that's what we wanted to make, so it just made sense. And then, yeah, I reached out to Adrian. He immediately um, was on board. He loved the pitch, and we got going. So it was... I don't know. It was just luck. It fell into my lap that I was looking for a publisher, and then suddenly the perfect one <laughs> showed up in my face. I know you said you were working on this with Victor anyway, but um, with Addison and Simon, were they people that you picked to work on this with you, or was that somebody that Vault said, hey, you're going to work with these guys? Addison already was working on other Vault books, but Victor handpicked Addison. Victor loves Addison's colors and wanted a very specific... Uh, like mildly rendered, um, really color rich coloring for the book. And so he, that was the first thing he said immediately was, can we get S? Uh, and then, yeah, no, uh, Simon, we got through Vault, but I couldn't be happier. Good lettering is, uh, the unsung hero of all good comics. And, uh, he's been amazing. And I kind of, on the first issue, I, got wrapped up in promoting the book and in writing later issues and didn't do a lettering draft before Simon uh, got was given the draft to letter. And so I had to apologize profusely because it got, like, what I like to do when the art gets done is take a look at it with the script and then chop the script up and make it, you know, change dialogue doesn't work, facial expressions are different, pacing needs to be fixed. I move all, all sorts of stuff around, I rewrite things, I cut a lot of stuff out, and I didn't have an opportunity to do that because I didn't communicate that. And so Simon sort of had to get letter the first issue twice, and I owe Simon, uh, I don't know, whatever he wants to pay him back for that because I feel terrible that he had to do extra work. but. I'm really happy, really happy with how the first issue reads, and his work on both versions of it were just phenomenal. Well, if what you sent me is the final version of what's going out, then yeah, you win probably more than you're thinking. Yeah, no, that that's you. That was the other thing is me asking him to do that pushed us being able to share it back. Um, so I really screwed up. I apologize to everyone and. They at least pretended like it's okay, <laughs> but that was a big screw up. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm thrilled with that reason. So, what kind of barbecue did you send them to apologize with? I haven't yet. Here's the bad thing about sending Kansas City barbecue: you can send it, but then the person has to cook it themselves. Like what they send you is just raw meat with instructions, uh, which makes sense because it has to, you know, like they have to pack it with ice or whatever. But what I found in the past is you're kind of creating a bunch of work for someone. So what I need to do is have them all come to Kansas City and visit, and then I can take them to have a much easier version of Kansas City barbecue so they can have it. But it's it's in the cards. That does sound nice for them, but I can also... I can see the appeal in coming home and having a giant slab of meat waiting for me. Yeah, I mean... It... If you don't mind cooking a giant slab of meat, I guess that's what I should ask. If do you guys like smoking meat? Because I could send you some. That's probably. Well, you guys heard it here first. It's my fault that you are going to be sending giant slabs of meat in the mail. Or not. I mean, you're right though. The art on this is gorgeous, and like especially. Seeing this first page with the phone screens and okay, you know, cold, and then switching to the real life colors, 
just all of the different choices there that Addison made on the colors that Victor made on how the water is going to interact with things and refraction and letting you see it and stuff and just the way that both of them are working to let you know this is a flashback thing stuff like that it is amazing work yeah no it's I couldn't be happier with the art it's that that's what I, I Vault has an amazing marketing team that does a really good job of promoting all this stuff and every conversation we have I just I push the art I'm like all we have to do is show people the art these people <laughs> these guys are making and uh, that's gonna sell a book so I I'm just blown away all the time Victor makes fun of me because every time he sends me a page I tell him it's perfect but it is like it if, if this book just keeps getting better with every page he's so talented and he's capable of drawing like the, the craziest most disturbing Lovecraft monsters and then also he does this amazing architecture in perspective so every every page and panel has dimension and scope but then when he draws a facial expression like he nails the acting every time so like in a close-up his close-ups are just as interesting as his big crazy cutouts that shows like you know underneath san antonio and all the pipes and sewers and stuff like it, it's just gorgeous i mean flipping through this thing there is not a bad page on here yeah no like i said he made a he made a bookstore beautiful he's a gifted man well, he made an actually fuzzy-looking octopus. That's <laughs> yeah. what impresses we, me. We should sell this stuffed octopi. That I love that part. I had forgotten it, um, you know, because I wrote the first issue a long time ago, and when I was doing the lettering, I had forgotten that bit with the stuffed octopus at the beginning. And yeah, he made it gorgeous. Why an octopus? Well, because only Lupe could find a stuffed octopus cute in a world that has been ravaged by elder gods and tentacle monsters. <laughs> like, octopuses probably aren't cute anymore once you've seen buildings full of people eaten by, you know, giant lovecraft monsters. But to her, it's a stuffed animal. She didn't have any as a kid, and so she's really excited to find stuffed octopus. Yeah, I think they're cool. I was just surprised. Yeah, well, the idea is that that's a, like a seafood, like a chain seafood restaurant, and they sell those in the gift shop area where they sell the t-shirts and stuff. So that's why there is a stuffed octopus there. Uh, but yeah, we, it's kind of playing on the idea that Lupe doesn't see the monsters the way everybody else does. The face you're seeing that the listeners aren't seeing is because... You just made me think about them selling stuffed animals to little kids whose parents potentially just ate octopus. It is a thing that is really amusing to me here because barbecue restaurants always use cartoon pigs on their sign. And that has always been disturbing to me because, yeah, you're, like, you're going to go in there and order like a, a pulled pork. But then there's a pig with a chef's hat smiling at you as you come in. So <laughs> that's purposeful. I agree, it's creepy, but it's supposed to be. It just real subtly sets the tone for the entire thing. One of those, like, arrested development moments where you didn't realize what you were seeing was as important as it is. Right, yeah, we tried to do... The first issue, we really wanted to play up the, like, the meat cute, right? Like, these, we want them to be kids, you know, young people meeting and falling in love and, and doing all of the things that would be normal if they didn't live in this awful earth. So it's, we had to be kind of subtle with the horror in the background. It's like you see, you see what they're remembering at different times. Like there's, there's flashbacks, but they're not necessarily used for exposition so much as this is what this character is thinking about in this moment when this question's asked. And this is why he doesn't want to answer it honestly. Or, um, you know, it gives a little bit of context to why they're both keeping each other at arm's length even though you know they, they're um getting to know one another and it may it makes for a really fun turn when we turn it because yeah at the end of this issue like you implied earlier 
there's kind of a reveal about what's really going on, and things get even more insane going forward. So, but we wanted, we wanted to give a little bit of, of breathing room for these two to fall. Well, I'm glad things are going to get even more insane because this is definitely one I'm going to throw on my pull list when I get to the shop tomorrow. And I don't know why it wasn't on there already, probably just because the past few weeks have been a little insane. But it should have been on there already. I appreciate that. Yeah, it's we've been trying to really, really promote the book and show it off because Vault is an amazing publisher. I'm lucky to be there. They put on only good books. They have a great marketing team. They work with fantastic creators, but you know, it is a relatively new publisher and not every retailer um, is going to know about everything Vault puts, puts out. So if you know anything you've seen online looks good or interesting or if the art looks gorgeous, which it does, uh, people should ask their retailers because that's how this stuff gets in the shops. So word of mouth is the way comics are sold. So please tell your retailer about the book, ask, ask to give it a shot. I think, I think people will love it. Yeah, luckily for me, I'm in a shop that tends to get most, if not all, of the number ones, and then they kind of see what happens from there. But listeners, like if your shop, I would say if it's not Marvel or DC, make sure that they're going to have it for you if you have any doubt at all. Yep, that's the way, that's the way this stuff works. And it's, it's frustrating as a creator sometimes because it is hard, you know, you're competing against all of these amazing books. And I think one of the cool things about the work stoppage during COVID is that everybody did kind of put more energy into creator own. So we're getting like this resurgence of, of lots of creator own content, which is awesome. Uh, I love all the great new comics that are coming out, but I'm also not competing with them. So anything you want, you should definitely say, yeah, mention it to your retailers. So you get a, get a shot to get that. Well, if it comes down to it with my wallet, I buy the single issues uh, from people like Vault and other publishers that you guys can probably guess, but this is about Vault today. And I'll buy the trades from Marvel and DC because those are going to get finished no matter what. Right. Yeah, it's it's been interesting for me because I I'm not super fast. I'm not super prolific. I can do two or three books a month at full speed, and so I most of my career has been Marvel. I did a couple of creator own books, and then I went and started working at Marvel, and they kept me busy and fed for over a decade. And then it wasn't until all that work stopped because of COVID that I realized, oh, it's been a long time since I've like developed something brand new from scratch and put put something together with a collaborator that wasn't kind of top down or based on an existing character and it's been really fun it's been really uh reinvigorating my career my creativity to be able to write stuff that's not just a superhero fight for eight pages in the middle of whatever other story i'm telling um but also i'm having to relearn how to be you know one of the main marketing people on all my books and and self-promotion and you know full collaboration where there's not an editor in the middle that's doing a lot of work for me and it's it's hard it's 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 a full-time job just telling people about the books once you've made them on top of you know, making them and finding home for them or whatever so yeah if, if you like indie comics if you like creator owned comics the best way to support it is just go to the place where you buy books and talk about it with the person that works there. do you know where you would t possibly take the story if it got to go past five issues? Yeah, there's a lot of different things you could do. The beauty of it is that it's an interesting world, you know, like the we've set up, there's a lot of cool backstory stuff you could do. Like you could tell the story of the fall, which like I said, the book takes place years after, so you really only see the aftermath. Um, and then we leave the characters in an interesting place at the end of it. So there's, there's an opportunity to revisit this world for sure. And it just, you know, comes down to sales, comes down to what Victor and I want to do next. But um, yeah, I, I've got I've got notes jotted down and Victor and I have discussed what we could do before. I don't know why I'm curious about this, but are you a pen and paper note person or are you a digital note person? I hate writing with a pen. <laughs> I have a I have a Care Bears spiral bound notebook that I don't even know where I got it. That is it lives in my backpack 
so when I'm on an airplane, I will write things out longhand. But my handwriting is terrible, and I hate how like dirty the page looks because I have to scratch stuff out and I can't delete. Um, and so I, I will only write on paper under duress. Uh, but I have a lot of like notes on my phone and stuff I've emailed to myself, and there's always a thousand uh, little Microsoft Word windows that are open with notes and things that I've written down that I never close my tabs. Um, so yeah, mostly digital. Uh, yeah, I don't know about never closing your tabs at all, as I do a bunch of video game research. Nope, not at all. Yeah, it's fun when you're researching. Like, I, I was, I'm doing this um, space graphic novella thing with Mad Cave Studios. I had to do a bunch of NASA research, which I, you know, I was into space as a little boy, and I really thought about it. So every time I go to close my tabs now, it's like, how do they make oxygen in space? And like, what does Cape Canaveral look like? Or whatever, it's all this different NASA stuff. And it, it it's kind of like a, you get to rewind your life and see what you were obsessing over three weeks ago or four months ago or whatever. Unless you're a, you know, I think most people would look at my desktop and screen because it's totally cluttered and covered and probably terrible for my computer. I don't even want to think about that. I've got a guy at work who I, I just want to go delete everything off his desktop just to mess with him. Yeah, I, I will do it occasionally because I recognize that it's bad. But it's always like, oh, I, I finished this deadline, I turned this in, I have a minute, I'll clean up my desktop. And I'm like, I'm going to keep it clean. But no, I'm not. I'm, everything's going to be crazy scattered for six, eight, nine months, and then I'll clean it again. Um, I do notice that when I clean it up and close things down and shut my computer down, it runs faster for a few days afterward. So what is currently your desktop background? It is one that I stole from Ivan Brandon, and it is a picture of the tide coming in and it says stop effing off and the idea is when you see this you stop messing around and get to work the problem is it's so covered in uh all of the shortcuts that i've saved and all of the stuff that you can't read it plus there's always 15 windows open so i only see the message that's supposed to tell me to get back to work <laughs> when i'm uh done working long enough to clean my desktop so it doesn't really work so sounds like you just need to get another monitor whose only job is to show you that picture yes i get. I, I mean i guess i could get a print of it made and hang it up somewhere yeah i do i definitely need another monitor how many monitors are you running right now i used to be two um because i had a desktop and then i would hook my laptop up to it and have two but i that desktop got flooded a couple of years ago, and the monitor, I don't know what the hell happened to it. So, yeah, now I have one laptop that is <laughs> probably going to crash on me sooner rather than later. Um, when I do video editing, I have to plug in an external and make sure that I'm like set up at home because it's so overstuffed that it does it runs slow and won't do things. but. I'm mostly just running Microsoft Word for work, so it, it's okay for now. Well, I hope you get something good and working and have nice backup things so you don't lose all your work. Well, my work... The beauty of my work is it's just Word files, so it's on the cloud. So I, I've crashed three laptops in my career, and I've never lost any files. What ends up happening is I have to frantically find some place to go type the rest of the script and where to pull it. Um, so I, I keep I keep my previous laptop in working condition just so I have backup typewriter. Uh, but yeah, I I feel myself becoming like the old man version of me that can't program the VCR, kind of the trope because I become more and more of a ridiculous Luddite as a guild. And I already was, like, I write everything in Microsoft Word. I don't, I don't use any fancy software. I know the things that my computer and phone do that I've had to learn, and I don't know anything else. Um, so I feel like me as an old man is going to be real ugly. i be the only guy that doesn't use the VR goggles or whatever. Matt, I mean, I don't think you're that much older than me. I don't think I'm going to use the VR goggles either. They, I don't know, you never know. 
I remember everybody made fun of the iPad when it first came out because it had a silly name, and now my children can't function without it. I used to be a substitute teacher, and I don't even want to think about having to be in a classroom where everybody has iPads. Yeah, it's wild to give them iPads. Like, my kids have iPads here, and then they have school iPads, and that seems like a terrible idea. But, you know, every job they do is going to require that. So I suppose it makes sense. Um, I have a... My stepdad can't use a computer at all. Like, doesn't know how to turn it on. Anytime he has to fill out a form that's online, my mom has to sit there with him at the computer. And, like, I think maybe that is... Like, it's impressive that he's managed to hold out this long to do that. But I I get it a little bit more now. Because, yeah, my kids, like, they have toys, physical toys, but they don't play with them. Everything they do, everything they want is on the screen. So it's not going to get better. Part of why I don't have my own kids. I don't have to deal with anything like that yet. Yeah, it's, they're, I love them. And they're, they, their generation is going to teach our generation a lot, I think, because of their priorities are just completely different. You know, this this stuff that came into our lives when we were already like sort of grown, it's the only thing they've ever known, you know, like an iPad was a baby toy to them. Uh, and so they're, it, not only are they adopting that stuff quicker and do they care more about that, but like, things that exist in the physical world aren't more important to them than things that exist online. And you can kind of, you know, you can see that bleeding into society in general, but as soon as they're adults, like, what does that even look like? So it's, it's sort of terrifying and fascinating all at the same time. Well, speaking of things that might be terrifying, what do you want to be when you grow up? Now or as a child? Now, because I'm assuming that you're like me and you're not considering yourself a grown-up. Uh, I don't know. I didn't until my kids got into school. Now I have to wake up at 6 o'clock in the morning to take other people places I don't want to go. So I feel a little bit more like a grown-up. Um, but what I want for myself going forward more than anything is to be able to keep telling stories and creating you know, creating characters and worlds and being creative for a living, but more in my, on my own terms and in a way where I get to spend time with my family and have a life outside of it. And one of the best things about comics is it's super self-directed and mostly you just get to sit at home and, and, and daydream. But one of the worst things about it can be you never get off work. You know, like you're constantly under deadline you're constantly like somebody needs something from me all the time and as I get a little bit older and I've been doing this for whatever 12 13 years now it would be nice to be able to turn it off and recharge um, a little bit more so uh, I guess time management is what I want when I grow up <laughs> and who would you say is your favorite Muppet Muppet that's a great question um animal why animal because you sound not sure I don't know because he's cool looking and he plays the drums and he's I my relationship with the Muppets is weird because I net my parents weren't into it so I never really watched the Muppet show or the movies until I was a little bit older and but I watched the heck out of Muppet Babies cartoon that was on and Animal was the best character on Muppet Babies because he was basically just like a sight gag who would pop up every once in a while. Um, so maybe that's why. But yeah, I, I just think he's just all this frenetic energy and drums. It's a fun kick. So if they ever got the rights issues figured out to get Muppet Babies on DVD, how quickly would you go buy that set? I would definitely stream it so my kids could watch it. Although what I found is they don't care. Most of the things that I liked when I was a kid that I try to show my kids. They like the idea that it was something I was into, but they don't want to watch it. Like He-Man, Masters Universe, that was my thing when I was in like kindergarten and my kids were that age, you know, a year and a half ago. And they would watch it and they'd be excited to learn and they'd like 
that it was something I liked and they liked to look at my old toys, but they didn't actually want to watch the show at all. They just beat each other with the stick and pretended it was a sword while it was on. Um, so I suspect my that they would be bored by Mappa Babies as well. Although I will say they did like reading Rainbow. We put reading Rainbow on for them when we wanted them to calm down the other day. And the uh, opening credits, they were very skeptical. Like, what is this? Absolutely not. But then when the show started and LeVar Burton was LeVar Burton, they were wrapped. And they watched like three episodes in a row or whatever. So some of that stuff stands the test of time. I, but I don't, I haven't seen Muppet Babies myself in so long that who knows? Yeah, anybody who doesn't like LeVar Burton, I don't know if I can trust them, even if they are a small child. Right? Yeah, you know, I, I loved the show, obviously, when it was on, but you don't appreciate how brilliant he was and how perfect he was to be talking to children. Like he's a, he has a Mr. Rogers energy that is infectious. Has it hit your kids that you write comics yet? Do they care about that at all? A little bit. They're young enough that they're not, like, over dad yet. They're getting there. They're much more argumentative than they once were. But, and they, like, they can read now. So they're really excited about the idea of my comics going forward. And like, they read Avengers Arena recently, and we're super excited about that. One of my kids is named after Cullen, Blunt, Cullen Bloodstone, who I named after Cullen Bond. Uh, but he came to the Comic-Con here in town dressed as Cullen Bloodstone, because uh, he's like the right-ish age for it. And so they're excited about that, and they like the idea that I make comics. I'm not sure they understand that I don't draw them yet. And I'm not sure how impressed they actually are by the books themselves, but when they know something new is coming out, they're very excited about that book coming out and they want to read it. Um, I'm good friends with Scotty Young and Kyle Strom, who have uh, Twig, this is a new comic that's out, it's coming out now. And they are much more invested in that comic than anything I've ever done. Like, they're very excited to read the next Twig. So it's, you know, the kids are only going to be so impressed by you. You make them brush the teeth and go to bed on time. Twig does have a thing on this that I know of. Peach Momoko covers. Yes. As far as I know, this does not have any of those. No. We do have uh, some amazing variants, though. Uh, that All of the variants are just incredible. Um, but Jenny Frizen did one that is equal parts like the cutest cover I've ever seen and the most disturbing cover I've ever seen. So we we are we are playing the variant game hard. That is the one thing that my shop is not too too good at with these smaller publishers. That they get the variants that they're sure will sell, which are not always the best ones, I think. Yeah, it's a whole it's a part of the it's a part of the collecting game that I don't I was never into. Like I never bought variants because when I was doing most of my collecting and organizing and that part of my comic fandom, I was in college, didn't have any money. So I wasn't gonna pay extra for like a special version of something. Um, but yeah, it's really it's really interesting to to meet collectors that are really into that and uh, trying to learn how to do it right. Because you know, you wanna you wanna make the book interesting for everyone. But Vault seems to have a handle on it, so yeah, we're doing we're doing cool variants. Vault does cool things. That's just generally how it works. Yeah, I got I have no negative words. Well, if anybody has negative words about Vault, then I don't want to be their friend. Like I don't love every book that Vault has put out, but I don't regret reading any of them either. Yeah, no, they're fantastic. No, I feel like uh, if we don't watch out, then we would end up doing this for way too long tonight. So thank you again for coming on the show. And if people want to hear more from you, where else can they find you around the internet? I am Dennis Hopeless Comics on Instagram, Dennis Hopeless Comics on TikTok, Hopeless Dent on Twitter. Um, oh, those are the best places to find me, I think. Uh, Oh, and then also I do a YouTube show periodically with Kyle Strom and Colin Bunn called Missouri Swagger. You can find me there. But yeah, the Twitter is probably the easiest way to, to contact me um, directly if you want to get a direct response. But talk to your reseller about Hard Eyes. 
Um, please check it out. I, I can't wait for everybody to read it and let us know what you think. Because if you don't like this book, then yeah, that's just crazy. This book is amazing in every way. Also, Thanks we'll so have much, links man. to all the stuff down in the show notes because that's a whole lot easier than trying to remember how to spell things. Yes, and I have a stupid Twitter name, so look there. And as always, if you want to hear more from me, you can head on over to playcomics.com where this might be where you're finding this anyway, but it does have links to all the social media stuff, including Twitter and Facebook and Discord and all the fun stuff like that. If you want to help support the show, it's also where you can go help support the show, where you can find links to Patreon or Kofi or buy me a coffee or, you know, all the fun stuff like that. Or just put the show in someone's ear holes after you get their permission to do that, because stuffing things into people's ears without them knowing about it first is not a good feeling. Don't ask me how I know that, but it does involve a cat. Please don't forget that Play Comics is a part of the Gunna Geek Network, home to a bunch of wonderful shows, especially Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D., who lets me come on and not have to edit, which is great, because doing the talking is the fun part. If you like the music that I'm rudely talking on top of, head on over to soundcloud.com slash best-day to check out Best Day's music, but most of all, just grab a game, grab a stack of comics, and go find yourself a new favorite character.